All right, um, welcome. Um, in this uh, video, I'm going to go over session 1.3, um, and that is on rates of change and behaviors of graphs. So in this section, uh, we're going to discuss or perhaps define, right, define the average rate of change of a function. And then uh, we're going to use a graph to determine where functions increasing decreasing or constant, okay? And then we're gonna use a graph to locate the, what's called the local maxima and local minima. Uh, sometimes they refer to these as relative maxima and relative minima. Okay? Uh, maxima and minima, that's being, that's a, being plural, okay? Or more than one uh, maximum or more than one minimum, okay? The next thing is uh, we're going to, again, look, given a graph okay, of a function, we're going to locate the absolute maxima and absolute minima. Okay. All right, so let's first talk about, or let's first define the average rate of change. This is a very, very, very important topic, um, especially if you go into applied calculus or the STEM uh, level of calculus. Okay. Um, it's it's the beginning. Okay, you can think of it as the beginning of, of calculus. Okay, combined with some other concepts. Okay, so let's go ahead and define this. And so, um, so to start out with, before we actually define this, I want to open this up with a with an application. Okay. Okay. So. First, let's let's suppose um, you're in a vehicle, right, or you're driving a car, and you're driving along, right, and you're starting. So you're starting from some point. Let's say the from you, you turn, you get into the car, you turn on, and you start from there. So that's that's our starting point, and then you drive, okay. And let's assume, right, um, that we're going at a constant rate, okay. Um, and we're interested in basically, okay, we're interested in finding the average rate of change over a given time interval, okay? So let's, uh, let's draw up a graph for this. Okay, so for the this is your independent axis, right? This is your dependent axis. Okay. Let's call this, well, this is going to be T. So that's T for time. And let's assume that time is in hours. And let's assume that our, our dependent axis is distance. So the distance at which the car is traveling from the starting point. And this is gonna be in miles. Okay. So let's first uh, assume, right? So as we, right, as you're in the vehicle, um, let's assume after one hour that the car has gone 50 miles. So here's one hour, right? There was 50, right? So we have a coordinate there. Remember in section 1.1, we talked about an ordered pair, okay? That is, right, this is an example of an ordered pair. T is one, the distance is equal to 50, okay? Input, output, right? Okay. Okay, so here's some more data points that were given. After two hours, the car has gone 100 miles. After three hours, car has gone 150 miles, okay, so, so we have a coordinate there, and then after three hours, we have uh, the car is going, or has traveled a distance of 150 miles, and let's put in one more value, okay, so let's assume after four hours, the car has driven a distance of, let's say, 200 miles. Okay. 
Okay, so let's let's draw let's draw a line through there, okay? Because these are all, if you notice, these are basically these all fit to to a line. Because remember, in the beginning, we said that we we're looking at an application where the car is going is going at a constant rate. Okay, so when we say in math, when we say a constant rate, and we plot. We basically plot that um, those data points. It's going to fall in a line, okay? Right, and that's what we see here. Okay. So the car is moving, right? So the car is traveling at a constant rate. Okay. So in other words, it's not slowing down, right? And it's not speeding up. It's okay. So it's traveling at a at a constant rate. Okay, a constant speed, if you will. Okay. So we have, so this is given, okay? And let's say we want to find, okay? Let's say we want to find the average rate of change over some given interval, okay? Particularly the time interval, okay? So let's calculate that. So let's say in this case, the average, in case we're interested in the rate of speed, right? So the average speed, And the average speed, okay, over over the interval from one to four. Okay, that's what we want to figure out. Okay, what is the average speed of this vehicle over the time interval going between one and four hours? Okay, so the way you calculate this is. Okay, you can so one way to or one way to, to conceptually see this is uh, by looking at the graph here. Okay. We're going between one and four, right? So we're going to take the difference between the distances over this time over this interval. Okay. So here, right? So we're going from one to four. Okay, so I'm gonna draw, I'm gonna draw a triangle here. Okay, and so what we're going to do is we're going to take, okay, we're going to take the distance, okay, distance over this interval, okay, and divide it by, oh, sorry, this is the time, sorry. So that's the difference in time, and then here is your difference in the uh, the difference in the miles. Okay. So I'll just write it here. Okay. So again, we're interested in finding the average speed over this time interval. Okay. So the difference in time is going to be this. So obviously it's going to be four minus one, which is three three hours and then over right and then you have these right the difference in these miles okay so let's write that out mathematically okay so we're going to have 200 minus 50 okay so that is right this different diff, this difference 200 minus 50 okay that corresponds to these two points okay in fact, what I can do here is I can, I'll go ahead and put in the coordinates. So this is at 150, 1 comma 50, and the other one's at 4 comma 200. Okay, so all you're doing is taking the difference of the output values, okay, because this is our, this is the axis, okay, for distance. So 200 minus 50, and then we divide by the difference in time, which is here. Okay. which is this interval, okay? All right, so that's just going to be 4 minus 1, which obviously we know is 3. Okay, so let's simplify this. So 200 minus 50, we all know it's going to be 150. Divided by 3. And so 150 divided by 3, right, it's going to be 50 miles okay, per hour. Okay. 
Okay, so the units is very important here. Remember, it's this is the speed, right? So the speed is always the change, right? The change in distance over the over the difference in time. Okay. So we have, right? So this is the change in distance over the time interval, right? The difference in the, the difference in this time interval, which is three. So miles, so 50 miles per hour. Okay, so hour, so hour, that is your, so this is the distance per unit of time. Okay. All right. So that is, right? So that is how you calculate the average speed. In other words, that is another way of saying, or a general way of saying the average rate of change over this time interval. Okay. So let's do another one for a different, right? Uh, for a different time interval. This time we want to calculate the average speed between um, or over the time interval between one and three. Okay, so going between one and three this time. So I'm gonna use a different, different color here. So here is three. So I'm gonna, so this is basically three comma 150. Okay, so here's, so that is the corresponding triangle for that, or, uh, for this interval, okay? So again, so we're gonna take the difference, right? And, okay, the difference in, for this, okay, for the difference in these values, divided by the difference in the time values here, okay? okay? So this time, our time interval, right, is this. Okay, there's the time and our distance is gonna be here now. Okay. Okay, so that's going to be 150 okay, minus 50 divided by 3 minus 1, right? So that's coming from here. Right, so this is going to leave us with 100 over 2, and half of 100 is 50. And again, we have the units there, so 50 miles per hour. Okay, so it's not surprising, right? Should it be that surprising that we're getting the same value? And the reason is because we're assuming, right? Um, we're assuming that this vehicle is traveling at a constant rate of speed. So no matter what two points I pick, right? Um, no matter what two values, okay? If we're assuming that this car is going at a constant rate, or constant speed, um, then the the average speed will always be the same, and that is the that is one of the properties of of a um, application uh, involving a linear function. Okay, so when I say linear, linear uh, is just basically a line. Okay, um, some of you may also know right um, that the that this number is also, right, it also, is also the slope of that line, okay? Um, but the slope, but here the slope is being used in an application sense, right? So, um, yeah, so we'll be looking at um, later on, in, starting in Chapter 2, we'll be looking at um, some properties of the line as a, as a function. Okay, but that is, um, basically that is how you can figure out uh, the average speed for some given, uh, for some uh, application problem. Okay, so let's let's define what is, so let's go ahead and um, state what the average rate of change is for, for any function. Okay. okay, so when we talk about average rate of change, it doesn't necessarily, you don't necessarily have to be working with something linear. In other words, you don't have to be, it doesn't have to be a, a line. It could be any function. Okay, um, so, so something like this. Okay, 
So again, there's my there's my independent axis, my dependent axis. So let's assume that the function uh, looks like this. Okay. Okay. So this is a nonlinear function. Okay. So I'll just write that here. Meaning that it's not it's not a line like this, but we can still we can still talk about the average rate of change over some given interval. Okay, so let's so speaking of intervals, let's define what our interval is. So let's suppose that x one is here, and over here somewhere is x two. Okay, so what what I'm going to do is I'm going to we're going to figure out the outputs for each of those. Okay, and remember this is this is going to be for some f of x value. First, sorry for some function. Okay. Okay, so tracing these back up. Okay, so x one, right? So x one and x two are your inputs when you put them into whatever this function is. It's going to be f of x1. And here it's going to be f of x2. So just this, right? So we're working with just a general, uh, some general variables here. Okay, and if, uh, in a few minutes, we're going to go over some specific examples. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a line to connect these points. Okay, by the way, so that line, okay, um, is what's called the secant line, okay? And basically, it's a line that goes through um, two or more points uh, for, a, for a function, right? So, right, so this line is intersecting here and intersecting up here with this function, with this, right, with this curve. Okay, so we call that a secant line. Okay, so by definition, right, the average rate of change, okay, so which we can abbreviate arc, right, is basically, okay, it's, okay, it's the, right, remember, so it's what we did over here. It's the difference in the function values, so f of x2 minus f of x1 divided by the difference in this interval, okay? So again, well, we can go ahead and I can go ahead and sketch in the rectangle there. Sorry, not rectangle, it's triangle. And so that gives you some geometric sense of what's going on, right? So it's just the difference, right? So this, this basically this link, right? Okay, divided by this length. Same thing as we did over here, right? But it's, this one's for application, right? So the difference, right, divided by the this one. So the length of this divided by the length of this, okay? Okay, so that is, right, so this is the general formula for the average rate of change, okay, uh, for a function, right, on a given interval. Okay, so it's, so the average rate of change given our function on some interval. Okay, so whenever they ask you, okay, whenever you're given a problem and ask to find the average rate of change, they have to give you the interval. And if you think about it, right, think about what we did over there and here. So this average rate of change is really nothing more, right? It's nothing more than the than the slope of that secant line. Okay, 
So like I said, later on, we're going to get into, uh, we're going to discuss um, some properties of the line. But, but that's what this is. This is just the slope of that secant line. <laughs> And this is very important um, in calculus, okay? Um, the reason it is the reason this is important is because in calculus, um, you we and there we talk about uh, the derivative, okay? And so the idea, okay, so let me go over here. So going back to this, right? This this part, this line here. Any two points, right? Any two points, you can figure out the slope for that line, okay? Basically, the slope is just basic, it's basically this, this formula here, okay? Distance, right, divided by the difference. This, this distance divided by this distance. So now, what if, right, what if the function looks like this, okay? So something that's not linear, right, okay? Something that's not right in a straight line. So how do you right? So how do we find the slope of this? Well, geom so it turns out that it depends on where depends on which portion of the function you're talking about, right? So it turns out that the right that the slope of a, of this kind of function right, it's going to be, like I said, it's going to be dependent on where you are. So, for example, so if I'm there, right, or let's say I'm here, those are going to have two different slope values because it turns out that the slope of this function is going to be, okay, by, by definition, it is basically the slope of what's called the tangent line. So the tangent line is basically where that line and the function intersects at one value, one point in a certain region, okay? Right? And so we have something over here as well, right? So you have this. So my point is that to find the slope of this function will depend on the location. So the slope of this, so the slope of this function will be the slope of this line, okay? The slope, if you're talking about the slope of this function and you're here, well, it's gonna be the slope of this line. Obviously, these two different, uh, these are going to have two different slope values, okay? All right, so that is, right, so that is what's discussed in calculus, okay? And so this is used, so where this is going to be used um, is that you can quantify, right, you can figure out what these values are for, this, for the slopes by looking, by starting to look at the secant line, okay? And then there's, an there's another concept that you that you you will learn in calculus, and you combine these two ideas, and then with that, with those ideas, you can figure out how to you can figure out a, a really elegant way um, to come up with the slope of these tangent lines. Okay? And it was um, it was Newton who actually um, formalized this idea, and so basically um, uh, that is so what when he wrote his manuscript, right? Um, that is the basis, the foundations of, of calculus, okay? So that is, so stay tuned for that. If you plan on calculus, you'll be learning more about that, okay? So again, my point is that this is very important, okay? Uh, this idea of the secant line, because you'll definitely, um, you'll definitely use this um, when you get to a calculus course, okay? So let's go through, um, Let's go through some specific examples of applying this, okay? By the way, just notation-wise, okay? Sometimes you may see this certain textbooks written this way. Especially in calculus books. So I might as well introduce it now. Um, sometimes you'll see this in pre-calculus books, okay? So this, is, this symbol just means change, okay? Right, so change in Y. That's what this is, right? It's a change in y divided by the change in x. Right? That's all that means. Okay.
Okay. So this is delta y, delta x. Right. So same thing, just using different notation. Okay. So let's look at some specific examples of this. And we're going to go to uh, quite quite a few examples of this because it's it's really important topic. Let's see. So let's do that over. Let's see, I think I have space over here. Let's see. And so we want to calculate the average rate of change. So I'm just using the abbreviation for for this given function. Okay, so we don't always remember we don't always have to use f of x. Okay, um, it's very important to be able to learn how to work with different letters. Um, again, especially if you're going to calculus or or any other math, math calculus, but you on this one. Okay. Right. So this, so, but the important thing is that this is, right, this is just using function notation. So this is saying that H depends on T. So T is the independent variable here. So we have the function T, uh, sorry, two times T squared minus two. And we want to, right, and we want to calculate the average rate of change for this function from T equals three to T equals two, six. Okay, let's do it. All right. So first, it's always a good idea, especially if you're doing uh, practice problems, homework problems. Okay, is to always write down right. If they're so, if they're if if they're mentioning a formula to use, always write down that formula. That way, it helps you remember it because you'll need to know that on the exam. Okay, because that formula is not going to be given to you. Okay. So, okay. So we're going to go ahead and write this down. So h of 6 minus h of 3 divided by 6 minus 3. So basically just using this idea, okay? All right, so we have our function, okay? We have that, right? We're going between 3 and 6, okay? So like over here, we're going from x1 to x2. So you do f of x2 minus f of x1 divided by x2 minus x1. By the way, if you switch, if you switch these and you don't switch these, it's going to, their answer is going to be off by a negative. So if you, if you accidentally switch this, then you need to switch the bottom. Okay. Otherwise you're going to get a um, different value. Okay. Uh, all right. So we did H of six minus H of three divided by six minus three. So, um, so usually it's done in that order. Okay. All right, so now we just need to figure out, okay, uh, we need to evaluate the functions at six and three. So that's 1.1 material, right? So given a function, you're evaluating these input values. So let's go ahead and take care of that. Let's first do h of six. Okay, so we get two times six squared minus two. Okay. Um, so that's going to give us two times 36 minus two, so that's gonna give us 70. And then we have h of three. So two times three squared minus two. So again, what I'm doing here is figuring out these components. So we have our function, okay? okay. So you're putting in six here, right? So you put six, right, in four, Replace t with six. Okay, so two times six squared minus two, and then two times three squared minus two. Okay, so this is going to give us. So this is going to be three squared is nine, right? Two times nine is eighteen. Eighteen minus two is sixteen. Okay. 
So now we plug everything in. Okay. So we have this value. It's going to go in here. And then we have the other value. That value is going to go into here. Okay. All right. Okay, so we get average rate of change. Okay. All right. So 70. Right? So it's going to be 70 minus 16 divided by 6 minus 3. That's going to give us 3. Okay, so 70 minus 16 over 3, that's 54 over 3, okay. Right, and 54 divided by 3 is going to be 18. So that is, that is our final answer. Okay, so that is the average rate of change for this given function from t equals 3 to t equals 6. So it's nothing more than just utilizing this formula here. Okay. All right, let's look at a, another example. Okay, example two. Okay, so we want to calculate okay, calculate the average rate of change for this function. From t equals to three to t equals to three plus h. So sometimes we don't like I, like I mentioned before. Sometimes we don't always work with uh, we don't always work with just just with numbers. Sometimes we need to you know have sometimes we're working with something like this. We're going from three to three plus h. Okay. So when you get to calculus, you'll see. Um, you'll see why this is, you know, you'll see where this is used, okay? All right. For now, we just need to focus on given something like this to find, right, find the average rate of change, okay? Let's do that. So again, I always recommend writing down the formula first that we start to remember it. Okay, so when it comes, when it comes time to the exam, um, you already know what the formula is, and you already know how to utilize it. So f of, right, so we're going from 3 to 3 plus h. So f of 3 plus h minus f of 3 divided by 3 plus h minus 3. Okay, so again, just using this formula, okay? So this is, right, this is x, so think of this as x1, this is x2, okay? Same thing over here, right? This was x1, this is x2, okay? So I'll write that down here, okay? So this is, this is x1, this is x2, okay? okay. So let's, uh, so that's the setup, right? So um, part of problem solving, half the time is just setting up, right? Setting up the proper form, utilizing the proper formula and setting it up. And then the rest is usually where you're simplifying um, or solving something through the use of algebra. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and evaluate these. Okay. So we have f of 3 plus h. Actually, I'm going to use different color here. 
just in case it doesn't, in case it's not showing up well there. Okay. So F of three plus H. Okay, so we're gonna evaluate, this is our function, right? So we're gonna plug three plus H into here. So five times three plus H squared. So all I did is take this, plug it into there, right? So that's your input expression, and then you plug it into here, okay? And then we do the same thing with f of three, five times three squared. So that is gonna give us, um, so we take care of the power first, that's nine, nine times five is gonna be 45. Okay? By the way, uh, on the exam, um, there are no calculators allowed. Um, the only time, so the only part, of, well, the, there will be, a, so usually set up like this, part one, there is no calculator, okay? Um, part two is where you need a calculator, but that's pertaining for an application, right? And so, um, so the numbers, you know, are, uh, you have to use a calculator because there's no other way to do it for that problem, okay? Um, so, yeah, so just keep that in mind, okay? All right. So we have f of three plus h, okay? So let's go ahead and, and we have f of three. So let's go ahead and simplify this one here. So this right here, okay? Remember, so three plus h squared, right? Is the same as this, right? So we have three plus h times another three plus h, okay? So I'm going to, I'm gonna erase this, but uh, so I have some space here, okay? So I go ahead and work out the details here, okay? So this is gonna be five, okay? So this is what we, this is what we call binomial expansion, okay? So we're gonna, so we expanded that out. Now we have to distribute the three and H, okay? So you're gonna get, okay, three times three, And then we get three times H, H times three, and then H times H. Okay, so let's write that out. So we get three times three, right? Uh, that's gonna be nine plus you get, I'll write it that way. H times three is the same thing as three times H. And then we have, right, uh, another one here, okay, three H. Okay, and then H times H is H squared, okay? So we get three times three, okay? Then we get three times H, and then another three times H, okay? And then H times H, okay? So doing this kind of thing, this is an MD60 material, okay? All right, so you really need to be, right, for pre-calculus, for college level pre-calculus, you have to know, you have to be, you have to know your algebra, okay? Um, at the same time, I oh you know I can show you uh, I, I can show you the steps involved, okay? All right, but this right here, this is all like preliminary, okay? Material. Okay. All right. So let's so now we have this right. This is going to be five times nine plus six h plus h squared, okay? All right. So next thing to do obviously is to Distribute the five, right? So this is gonna be 45 plus 30H, okay? So five times nine, 45, five times six is 30, times H plus five times H squared, okay? So that is the function value of F of three plus H, okay? Um, so um, if you're doing the homework 1.1, you did, you probably most likely encounter problems where they ask you to evaluate the function at these kind of expressions. So now we're using it here, okay? Um, like I said, math is a very cumulative subject. All right, so we have this, okay? So now, and we also have F of three, which we did earlier. So I'll go ahead and write that back up here. So F of three is gonna be five times three squared. So there it is, we get 45, okay? Now we put, basically we assemble the pieces together, right? We put the pieces into here. So we have, right, we have these, okay, we just, right, we have the specific values. Okay, so, so F of three plus H, okay, that's here.
and have f of three here, which is here. So we're gonna plug those into there. Okay, so we get 45 plus 30h plus 5h squared. Okay, minus f of three, which is 45. All divided by, so three plus h minus three, so you get three minus three is zero, so we're left with h in the denominator, okay? Okay. So, right, so we have this part, right? Minus 45, all divided by H. Again, H is threes, cancel out, gives us zero, and then we have H left. Okay, so when you're, whenever we're, whenever we have these kind of problems, especially um, in this, for this specific form, things will usually cancel out, okay? And that's what we see here. We have 45 and 45, 45 minus 45 is zero, okay? And so that's gonna give us, 30h plus 5h squared over h. Okay? So, all right, that's zero. Okay? So now, by, by eliminating those, right, uh, we can go ahead and simplify this even further by factoring out h. Okay? So I can factor out, we can factor out h, so that leaves us with 30 plus 5h over h. So, H over H is one. And so we end up getting 30 plus five H. And that is our final solution. So like I said, later in calculus, you're gonna, you're, this is gonna be infused, right? Into another concept, okay? And that is, and then you'll see, at that time, you'll see the importance of it. So, so at this level, it's important to be able to do this algebra, okay? Um, because most likely, when you get into calculus, um, it, you know, the professor will do, will ask you, okay, they'll, they will have this information, and they'll say, okay, the average rate of change will be this. They won't explain this part, because that is a, that is a pre, that is what you're learning now, right? So it's, they won't have time to go into the details, okay? Uh, because there's because they're, there's um, they're teaching other concepts, okay? So just keep that in mind, all right? Um, okay. So the thing here now, right? So the important thing is that you're you're learning, right? You're um, you're using the algebra that you learned um, and applying that to um, to this uh, average rate of change. Okay. All right, so let's look at a different example here. Okay, and I'll erase this. Okay. Okay, okay example three. Okay. All right, there's our function, right? We're given um, one half times X plus three, and we want to find the average rate of change. Okay. So, sorry, there's two parts here. So find the average rate of change for the following intervals. Okay. So the first interval going between one and two, the next interval going between A and A plus two. Okay, let's, so let's go through this. Okay, looking at part A. Again, let's, re let's write out the formula, okay? So 
since we're dealing with f, this is going to be f of right, f of two right, minus f of one divided by two minus one. Okay, that's all there is. Okay. All right. So now we have to figure out those components. So we evaluate the function at two. Okay. Um, so f of two equals one half times two plus three. So one half times two is one, right? So one plus three is gonna be four. Okay, so now let's do the same thing for one. So we get one half times one plus three. So one half times one, obviously is one. Oh, sorry, obviously one half, right? So one half plus three. Okay, and so don't be afraid of fractions, okay? Have to get used to them. So one half plus three, in case you forgot how to do this, okay, I'll show you that. Okay. So we need a common denominator, right? And so we need to multiply, right, this one by two, okay? Right. The reason is, right, because we want a two here, so we have to multiply the top by two. Otherwise, we'd be changing the original value, okay? And so now, this is going to be what? You get one plus six over two. So you merge them to you put you put them over the same over the common denominator. So this is going to be seven halves. Okay. All right. So there's our two function values. Okay. So now, okay, we go ahead and plug those in. So there's f of two, right? And then we have f of one. Okay, all right, so we got there, we got to this point. So now let's plug everything in. So we're gonna get f of two, so that's four, minus f of one, all divided by two minus one is obviously one, okay? Okay, so again, so this is the same as four minus seven halves, since we're just divided by one. Um, using the same technique here, we can rewrite this as eight over two. Eight over two is four, right? So you multiply top and bottom by two, okay? Just as we did there. And so we get eight minus seven over two, which is gonna give us one half, okay? All right, so the, it's not, so it's not surprising Right, um, that this value of one half is the same as this value in front of x. And if you think about this, think about the uh, the very first example we did with the um, with the application with the car problem. So this is right, this is a line, right? Okay. Okay. Um, if you graph this, you'll see it's just a line. Okay. So. Again, so no matter what two points, right? Okay, no matter what two points you use, because this is a line, okay, the values are going to be the same, right? So the average, in fact, for the line, right, the average rate of change is the slope of that line. So that's why these are matching. That's my point. Okay. So this is increasing at a at, right, this is increasing at a, at the same rate. Okay. All right. So let's so let's do, let's figure out the average rate of change for this one. And we should be able to get the same value. Okay, let's do that. For B, So this time we have f of a plus h minus f of a, all divided by a plus h minus a, okay? Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and calculate these. Okay. 
f of a plus h, well, this is just going to be plug in or replace x with a plus h. So we get that. Right, so we get this. Okay. And let's go ahead and distribute the one half. Okay. Okay. Let's plug in or let's evaluate the function at a. So that's simply going to be one half times a plus three. Okay, so we have, right, we have those two function values. Now we can go ahead and plug everything in. Okay, so we have f of a plus h, so it's going to be one half a plus one half times h plus three. Minus, okay, so this is where you have to be really careful, especially when we're working with expressions, right? We're working with um, expressions that involve letters like this one, okay? So you have minus here, the minus is coming from here, okay? So you have minus, okay, one half a plus three. So it's always a good habit to put this in parentheses. Because if you don't do that, right, if you forget, if you don't do that, right, you're going to forget to distribute the minus, okay? So if you right think this, it's wrong, okay? Because the minus here gets just, it affects everything here, right? Right, so, so we put, right, so we put this in parentheses, okay? Just as a reminder, okay, to, as a reminder to distribute that minus sign, okay? Otherwise, it will offset everything, okay? Okay, and then divide by, again, similar to this, right? These values go, right, um, give you zero. So you get A minus A, which is zero. So we're left with H on the bottom, okay? So let's go ahead and distribute, or let's go ahead and uh, simplify the numerator. So remember what I mentioned a while ago is that if everything was set up properly, okay, then some of the terms should cancel out. So, so we see here, one half a minus one half a. Three, right, positive three, minus three. So that leaves us with a term with h in it, okay? So if, if you, right, so if something like this, if things are not canceling out, um, that most likely means that either this part is wrong, either you evaluate these, or either this is not correct, or the setup is not correct. Um, most likely, okay, most likely um, it means probably you forgot to distribute the minus sign here, okay? Okay, so let's proceed on. So this is gonna be one half H divided by H. H over H, right? There's a common factor, we can cancel those out and not surprising, we, we're left with one half, okay? So that's what I mentioned earlier, no matter what two points, okay? So you have two points here, you're gonna get one half, and then, and then these two, so, right? So no matter what two points, as long as those are not the same point, okay, you're always gonna get the same value as this for, for a line, okay? Right? Okay. So I encourage you for practice, um, this will be good practice, actually. Pick some other two points, right? Pick uh, pick like zero and five, and then figure out the average rate of change, and you should still be able to get one half, okay? Or if you pick like negative two and, let's say negative two and four, okay? Should still be able to get the same value, okay? Okay. Okay, let's look at a slightly more involved example. That would be example four.
And so find the average rate change for g of x equal to 2 over x plus 1 over this interval. over the interval from one to eight. And then um, we want to simplify, simplify our result. Okay. So again, right, the average rate of change is this time, right? We have g of x, so it's going to be g of a minus g of 1, all divided by a minus 1. Okay, so just set, you know, um, setting up, right? And then we're going to plug everything in. So let's figure out g of a. That's going to be 2 over a plus 1. And then g of 1. Be two over one plus one. So two, so that gives us two over two, which is one. So all, again, all we're doing is evaluating this function at a, and then at one. Right. If you have any issues of evaluating function, now is right. So now is the time to ask. Okay, um, you can come by the mass center, right? Um, come by my office hours because function. Evaluating functions is going to be used all throughout the um, course, including your uh, future math courses. Okay. Okay. All right. So we have these expressions. Okay. So now let's plug everything in. So we're going to get 2 over a plus 1 minus 1 all divided by a minus one. Okay. okay. Um, all right, so there's our expression, right? There's our average rate of change. Um, but we want to simplify the result because this is what we call a compound or sometimes complex fraction, meaning that we have a fraction, right? We have a fraction within, within this bigger fraction. So ideally, it's always a good idea to simplify these. Okay, right. And so let's uh, let's go through and do that. Okay. So the way the way to simplify this is to um, look at your denominator. Okay. Notice that we have a. Look at the denominator for each part. So we have a plus one here, and then we have we know we have one on the bottom, and then we have one on the bottom here. So the only denominator. Um, for each of these terms is a plus one. So what we can do in order to clear that denominator out, okay, we can multiply this top part by a plus one. Okay. Cool. All right, so notice that when I multiply this and this together, you have a plus one divided by a plus one. That's going to give us one. Okay, so I have to multiply everything in here. Okay, by a plus one. So if we do that for the top, we also, we also have to do it on the bottom. Otherwise, we'll be changing the original expression. So this is right. So this is essentially multiplying by one, right? A plus one over a plus one is just one. So that's to keep the problem. That's to keep the problem consistent. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So let's let's do that. So when we distribute here. We get two, okay, and I'll write this out. Okay, so we have a plus one minus, and here again, it's important to keep this in the parentheses because this is minus all this. And then we have divided by a minus one times a plus one, okay? All right, so a plus one over a plus one, Right, that's, think of this, right, this is just over one. So that's going to give us two. And then we have minus, I'll go ahead and distribute the minus sign here. 
So you have two minus a minus one. We have a minus one times a plus one. Okay, we're almost, almost there. Okay. All right, so what we can do from there is simplify the numerator. Two minus one is one, so we get negative a. Two minus, so two minus one is yeah, one, so we get minus a plus one, all divided by a minus one times a plus one. Okay, here's the thing, right? Hopefully y'all remember this, okay? Um, so you, this, right, a plus, this is minus a plus one, this is a minus one. So they almost look like this, they almost look the same, And okay? In fact, we can, what we can do is we can factor out, okay? We can factor out a minus sign from here. And so that way, this one will look like this. So if I factor out a negative, so I'm going to write this as a, okay, okay, minus one. Okay, why I put minus here? Well, because negative times negative is positive. And when you put the negative in here, that gives you minus a. Okay, so, so here we have a minus one and times a plus one. So now by factoring out that negative, this and this cancels out. Right? Okay, and we're left with one on top, okay, divided by a plus one. And that is that is the solution that we're looking for, okay? And there should be a sorry, negative there, okay? So the negative is coming from here, okay? So again, okay, factor out a negative from here, that leaves us a minus one, which is matching this, that cancel, that allows us to cancel out that. So that leaves us with a negative one on top, divided by a plus one, okay? All right, so again, this is, um, this is MD60 material, to be honest, okay? Um, that's what they're learning, that's what they learn in that class, okay? So if you, if it's been a while, right? Um, if it's been a while since you worked with algebra, then most likely you'll need to spend some time working on it, okay? But I'm, but also I'm always here for, um, you can always ask me questions, okay? But you can always go to the math center. Okay, let's do example five. Okay, we want to find the average rate of change. Given this function. Okay, over this interval. Right. So again, let's write down our average rate of change formula. So since we're dealing with F, we have F of A plus H minus F of A divided by A plus H minus A. Okay, so F of this expression minus F of this divided by this minus this. Okay, so again, we need to evaluate our function at these two expressions. Okay, so that's simply going to be square root of a plus h, okay? And for the other one, we have f of a, so that's going to be equal to square root of a. Okay, so let's plug everything in. Okay. So 
you have this part. And the other part. Just like we did here. Okay, same thing, right? Just plugged, right? Plug this into there. And then we plugged this into here. Okay. All right. Okay, so we have square root of a plus h okay, minus square root of a divided by, again, you have a plus h minus a. So that's a minus a is zero, so that's going to leave us with an h there. Okay, so ideally, um, we, we want to simplify this some more. Okay, we want to put this into a simpler form. Okay, so let's assume that we want to simplify this result. Okay. All right. In other words, can we right, can we go through a process, right? An algebraic process and um, and factor out this H on the bottom. Okay, so let's do that, okay? Yeah. Let's do that up here. So we have square root of A plus H minus root A over H, okay? So to do this, we have to use something else. Again, you're using some other concept, right? That's, that's a prerequisite for this course. And that is using something called a conjugate, okay? So let me explain what, or let me go over, review what that is. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this and multiply by the conjugate of this, okay? So the conjugate of this is going to be, okay? Take, you have, we have square root A plus H, and then we change the sign. Okay, and then we have root A here. So, so basically this, the conjugate of this is this, and the conjugate of this is this one. So they're conjugates of each other, okay? So that's what I mean. When we say, when we're using the conjugate, that means that we have this, right, with two different signs here, okay? So if we multiply the top by that expression, we have to do the same thing on the bottom. All right, because we don't want to change, we don't want to change the original problem. Okay. So that that technique that is using the conjugate. Okay. Okay. Okay, so you have different different signs there. So if that's plus. If that was plus, this is gonna be minus. So they have to be opposite, okay? So that is using the idea of the conjugate, okay? Okay, hopefully you all remember that, okay? From previous course, from previous math course, okay? All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and um, simplify this, okay? So the top part is gonna be square root of A plus H times the square root of a plus h, okay? okay. And then okay, we have, in fact, let me, I'll write it out in more detail, okay? Okay, so this is going to be, so we have this. That's what we have for the top part, okay? The bottom part, we're gonna have this. We have H times this one, okay? All right, so that's what we have right now. So let's go ahead and multiply our 
part. Let's go ahead and multiply this out on top. So we're going to get square root of a plus h times the square root of a plus h, okay, plus square root of a plus h times square root of a minus square root of a times a plus h minus square root of a times square root of a. And let's see. Okay. All divided by the denominator. Again, let me go over, let me just go over what I did there. So we, so just, so again, this is, right, this is the binomial expansion, right? So, right, you have this minus this, this plus this, right? So we have this, that's that one, and we have minus, okay? Okay, that's that term, then we have this one. which is, right, so you have this, okay, sorry. So this one, right? And then we have these two, which is here. And then we have this one, okay. Okay, so let me, I'll go through that again, just to make sure, okay. okay. So we took this one, multiply with this one, that's that term. And then we have this one, Right? Okay, so we distribute this to these two terms. And then we distribute this one, right, which is here. And then we take this one and distribute here. Okay? So that gives us the last term. Okay? So you may know that by what's called FOIL, um, which is basically just a distribution idea. Okay? So the all right, so let's go ahead and simplify this. Okay. All right, so this is, so these are, right, so they have the same value underneath the square root, so this is just going to be a plus h. This two, these have opposite signs, so this is just zero, so plus minus, right? And then we have root a times root a, that's the same thing as a. Okay. And then we have this on the bottom. Okay, so see what's happening now. Again, on top we get a minus a, which is zero. So we're left with h here, all divided by h on the bottom. And then we have h times this. Okay, so we have the denominator, a minus a is, is zero, so we're left with h. And this h over h is one. So that's going to leave us with one over square root of a plus h plus square root of a. So this, this is the answer that uh, that we want. Okay, that's a, that's the simplified result. Okay, very very important. You're going to be doing this again, right? When you get into calc one. Um, whether it's apply calc or, or these or the other or the more rigorous calculus class, okay, um, and then so you're doing this and then you're learning something else on top of that, okay. So very very important, okay. So you can see right, you can already see how important algebra is. Um, like I said, algebra is like the fundam most. It's the it's the fundamental right for all the math for all the math uh, courses. Okay, all right. So this is all, again, this should be, at least, it, you know, you should have seen this before. Um, that is covered, like I said, this is all, this part right here is covered in MD60. Um, that's what they spend time on, okay? Um, so really, the new part, the new part is just the average rate of change, okay? And then you're using algebra to simplify that expression, okay? All right. So I think I went through a, I went through a, a different variety of problems uh, involving average rate of change. So um, 
So make sure you know you you, you, know, you look over these examples again, um, and obviously uh, you know do the, uh, the do the assigned problems. Okay. The next topic is uh, we're going to look at uh, the behavior of a um, of a graph. Okay. So we're going to look at what it means for a function to increase, decrease, or or be constant. We're going to look at Right, how to determine that, okay? Okay. Already, let's look at this. Increasing, decreasing, or constant. Okay, so what does this mean? Again. Going to look at a graph here. Okay. Um, so there's our coordinate system. Okay. I don't know if I said this before, but whenever you're you know, you're putting, you're drawing, you're you're plotting something on a graph, it's always important to label your axis. Okay. Very, very important. Okay. All right. So let's assume that the function we have, it looks like this. And I'll have to extend my axis. Okay. Try to straighten that up. Okay, very good. All right, and let's say, okay, so you're, so in these problems that you're gonna see, um, it's important, right? It's important to identify where function increasing, decreasing, or constant. So this is our function, right? So the first thing you have to identify is where the function is changing direction, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and identify those. So if you notice, right? So first of all, when you're doing these, when you're when you're doing these kind of, you're doing this kind of problem, you're always reading, you always read the graph from left to right, okay? So, right? So notice, like, think of this as a roller coaster, okay? So as right, so as you move along this direction again from left to right, okay? Um, you're going up, right, and then up the roller coaster and then back down, okay? So. That right there, that is what we call a turning point. Okay, that is where there's a change of direction, right? So you're going up the roller coaster, right? And then going back down, okay? And so we're going back down, right? And then all of a sudden you're gonna go back up, okay? And then it's, and then the, right, the roller coaster flattens out. So there's a change here. And then the roller coaster goes back up. So there's a change here. So it's very important to, um, that's very important to recognize uh, those those points. Okay, so again, those are called turning points. Okay. Turning point there, 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 there. Four turning points. Okay, so in the graph, you can have as there can be as you know as many as you want. Okay, as many as whatever. Okay, whatever is given. Okay, so let's uh, identify those. So this is, I'm gonna call this A. This is B. So if you're given a specific problem, these are, um, sometimes they're gonna be labeled like this or sometimes they may even have like, they may have numbers there, okay? Um, but the point is that those are your, so the point is that 
what these are doing is dividing up this, basically dividing up this region into smaller regions, okay? All right. So, so based on what we see here, okay, we want to figure out, okay, where is this function increasing, okay? Okay. And the way, so the way we describe this is through, right, is through using the X values as, right, as your, as the locations, okay, so, right, as uh, in terms of your, of where, of where this is happening, okay, whether it's increasing, decreasing, or constant, okay, so, so when we say, so when we say a function increasing, okay, that just means the out, that's where the output values are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, okay. Right? Meaning, in this case, our y values are getting bigger. So, again, you're reading the graph from left to right. So, as you go from this way, right, as you go in this direction, okay, you're going to go up. Okay? So, always remember that you're reading the graph this way. Okay? Always from left to right. Um, and that's, that's going to be important because your solutions are going to be in terms of intervals. So, we're going up, right? Okay, so you're going up, so that means the y values are getting bigger and bigger, okay? And this, this arrow means that, all this arrow means is that this is going to continue going down, okay? But don't get confused with that. Remember, we always read from left to right, so the y values, right, are going from this, from this way to this way, okay? From right, from left to right, okay? So the y values are getting bigger, right? Okay, they're increasing, okay? And then all of a sudden they get smaller here. So that means you're going from, right? So the, the function increasing from minus infinity up to A, okay? A is where it starts to change direction, okay? So we're going down here, going down, down, down. And then again, right, right here, it's going up. So the Y values are getting bigger and bigger until it gets to C. So we put a union symbol there because we're gonna add on another interval. So it's increasing between B and C. And then there's one more, right, over here. After D, okay, so it's, right, after this, this is turning, so then it's going up. The Y values are getting bigger and bigger. So this is going from D to infinity, okay? So that is how you describe uh, where a function is increasing. And you use, you basically use these as your reference values, okay? So those reference values are your partitions, okay? And by the way, it's, you're always using parentheses. Okay, you never use brackets for, for this kind of thing, right? Okay, let's do decreasing. Okay, so decreasing means that's where, which part, right? Which of these intervals is the function decreasing? Meaning the Y values are getting smaller and smaller. Well, that's going to be here, right? You're going, right? Think of, again, think of this as a roller coaster. You're going down. So the Y value here, right? The Y values are getting smaller and smaller. Okay? And so that's occurring from A to B. Okay? All right? So again, I'm just going to... So if you look, if you compare, right? If you compare the Y value here and here, the Y value here, right? is bigger than the Y value here. So it's getting, right, so the, right, so the Y values are getting smaller only in this interval. Okay. Whereas over here, right, if you compare these two points, okay, the Y value here is smaller than the Y value here. So, okay, so these are getting, the Y values are getting bigger and bigger. Okay. All right. The, right, the third possibility is the constants. Constants, let's say it's remaining constant. Functions remaining constant means that the function is neither increasing nor decreasing. Okay, so it's right, so it's just so basically it's just a, a horizontal line, and that's what we see here. Okay, there is no change, right? There's no change in the y values. Okay. Okay, so that's what we call, it remains constant, 
Okay, and that corresponds to the interval from C to D. Okay. Okay, so that's how you, given a graph, that's how you identify where functions increasing or decreasing are constant. Okay, so you first look for the turning points, and then you go through, remember, you read from left to right. And then think of this, just think of it as a roller coaster, okay? You look for where the where you're going up, you identify the intervals where the where you're going up, okay, for increasing, and then for decreasing, you look on the intervals where you're going down. And then look for the intervals, inter, look for the intervals where the uh, where the function is not changing, right? Where it's constant, okay, such as this one, okay? And you always Always use parentheses. You never use brackets for this, okay, for, for these, okay? All right, I hope that, I hope this helps. Um, uh, that's, uh, and, and it's pretty, I hope it's pretty obvious, okay? Um, if not, just come talk to me. Okay. All right. Okay, um, so let's look at, yeah, so let's look at a specific example of this. Okay, so go ahead and draw up the graph. Sometimes the graph is given like this where it doesn't have any in, it doesn't it doesn't have arrows like on this one. Okay, but um, it's the same kind of idea. Okay. And so this one, okay, we are given, um, so we are given these, uh, we are given the specific numbers here. So let me go ahead and write those. Okay, we're given, let's see, so minus one is here. Then we have one. Let's see, this is, oh, well, this is at three. And this one looks like it's at five, okay? All right. Okay, so there's our, right? Uh, there's our, we have our graph. Let's call this f of x. So in this case, when you see something like this, um, it's it's starting here and ending here. Okay, all right. Okay, so let's uh, first do increasing. Okay, so increasing again. Think of this as a roller coaster, right? So you're going up. Okay. Kind of a rough looking roller coaster here because of this sharp turn. But in any case, right? So you're going up. Okay. So your y values, right? So the y, right? The y values are getting bigger on this interval. And it's going back down, right? And it's going back up. So um, so there are two intervals, right, where uh, this function is increasing. Okay. The first one, right? It's going, it's going between minus one and one. 
Okay? Remember, you always use parentheses. Okay? And then we have the third one, right? We put a union symbol there. Okay? I didn't. Let me just write that. Right? So this is basically called your union. Okay? You're just all you're doing is that's a way you can, so you're taking sets and putting them together. Okay, so we have minus one to one, and then the other one's from three to five. Okay. Okay, then decreasing, right? There's only one interval. Okay. That's here, right? The y values are getting smaller and smaller and smaller, right? Until it gets to here. So that occurs on this interval from one to three. So remember, when you're, so the increasing, decreasing, you're looking for, for increasing, you're looking where the y, child, y values are getting bigger, okay? And then decreasing means where the y values getting smaller. And you describe those in terms of your, in terms of the intervals on your x-axis, okay? So again, so the function's increasing over this interval, it's increasing over this interval. And then the function is decreasing over this interval. Okay. Same thing over here. Okay. But this is, remember, this is keeps going down. So, so we go from left to right. So it's increasing, right? From minus infinity to A. Okay. And then it's increasing from B to C over this interval, right? B to C. And then increasing, right, over this interval from B to infinity. And then decreasing from A to B. Okay. And it's constant here. There's no change from C to D. Okay. Right. Um, very. This is also an important topic um, because, again, in calculus you'll be learning something called the derivative, and then um, you'll be using right. You'll be using the derivative to help you identify where these happen without the without looking at the graph itself. Okay. So it's important to get this concept out. Okay. okay. All right, next thing, let's talk about the local maxima and local minima. Okay. Another very important topic. All right. Okay, by the way, so local, sometimes we call it relative. So local maxima or relative maxima, same thing here. Local minima or relative minima, okay? Um, so you'll see, you'll, you'll see why that is the case in a few minutes here. Okay, so let's, yeah, so we're using the graph to identify these. Well, let's go ahead and sketch the graph. So there's our function, okay. and this time right, we're interested in finding what's called the relative maximum or local maximum and uh, relative minimum. Okay, so again, um, it's important. So it's important to recognize where our turning points are. So we have a turning point there because that's where the function changes direction, and there's another one there. So 
those are called turning points. Okay. And where the function changes direction. Okay. All right. So if we right, so if we look here in this region, okay, um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put I'm gonna put an interval here. Okay. So if we look within if we look relatively, right, relative within this interval, okay, we can see that this value, right, um, has, right, it's the smallest y value with respect to right, with, within this region, okay? Notice it's not the smallest value, right? right? It, it's not the smallest value for this function because this one is going all, right? According to the arrow, it's going down, right? So the values are getting, right? It's getting smaller than this one, okay? So, right, so it's, um, so this is, right, so so this is the smallest value within this interval, and this is gonna go past that, right? So, all right, so, uh, so, so, but within this interval, right, this has the smallest y value, right? Okay, because again, the function is gonna go below the x-axis, which means that the values are gonna become negative, right? Okay, so let's give this, let's label this. This is x1, okay? And so if I'm calling that x1, and this is my function notation, this is just going to be f of x1, okay? So basically this is what's called a, uh, this is what's called a relative minimum or a local minimum, minimum okay? Which means, right, this is the, this is the lowest point, okay? It's the smallest y value within within a certain region, okay? Because again, over here, these are going, right? Um, okay, this is gonna go, eventually it's gonna, it's going to get, the y values are gonna go lower than this one, okay? So within this region, right? That is what we call, again, that's what we call a relative minimum, okay? And so this is how, so the way we write that, this way. Remember, minimum minimum means it's plural. So you could have more than one. In this case, we just have one here. So, so there's a relative minimum, minimum occurring. Or we can say at x1. Okay. So when you say relative minimum at x1, the x1 tells you where it's located. Okay. The relative minimum, okay, if we're not referring to the location, then we say the relative minimum is f of x1. So when we say when we say the relative minimum is something, that it means it's that's Right, it's the output. So there's a right, so there's a relative minimum of f of x1 that occurs at x1. Okay, so very important. This this statement, right, and this statement are two right, two different things. Okay, right. But keep in mind, right, we can refer to this as a coordinate as well. Okay. So sometimes we can write it like that. We can write it as a coordinate. But if the problem asks you, okay, what is the relative minimum? They want the output value, not the not the input value. The input value is just where where that value occurs. Okay. In this case, where the relative minimum happens. Okay, so be very careful with this. Okay. Likewise, okay. So going back to this real quick, okay. So so the the simple so the simplest way to think about this is it's basically where it's basically where your function, um, right? It, where it changes direction, where it goes from in this case from, right? You're going down and then going back up. You're going down then going back up. Okay, so if that happens. Okay, so you're going down then back up. That's a relative minimum. Okay. Likewise. 
Likewise, right, you can have the opposite effect. You can go back, you can go up, okay, right, going up here and then down, okay. Right? So you're going, so remember, so between here and here, this is, right, you're increasing, okay, and then decreasing. So that, so within, a, within this region, okay, within a certain region here, okay, There's a, uh, the function has uh, a, the largest y value, okay, with respect to this region. Obviously, this is, right, obviously there is, this is not the large, this is not the highest point because this function is going up, okay? Same, same thing here. This is not the lowest point in the graph because these are going below the x-axis, right? So these are getting more, right? They're going to get eventually turned to negative values, okay? But this is, right, this is, this is a, uh, this is the relatively largest y, there's a relatively large y value there for, with respect to this region, okay? Okay, so let's call this x2. Okay. So when you, right, so at x2, that's f of x2 then. Okay, so the way we write this, okay, Again, when we're talking about where where it's occurring, okay, it's in terms of the x value. So there is a relative maximum occurring at x two, okay. Relative maximum is the corresponding function value. So for this one, it's f of x2, okay, All right? And, and then we can, we can also state this as a coordinate, right? Okay. Okay. All right, so again, right, the relative, sometimes, again, sometimes we call this local minimum, local maximum, okay? So it doesn't matter which, doesn't matter which one you use, okay? All right, so where the function's going, where you're, right, so where it's going down, going back up, that's a relative minimum. Where it's going up, then going back down, that's a relative maximum. So that's the, that's the simplest way to think about it, okay? And then the other important thing is the X values is where you, is where those are located, okay? Um, if they ask directly where the relative minimum or relative maximum, that's your output values, okay? Okay. okay. And by the way, there is a um, there is a way to do this on the calculator um, uh, because. Unless, if we don't have a calculator and you're given a function like this, you have to use calculus to find out what these are, okay? Um, and so, um, so that's why I said all the, the problems that you'll see, you'll be given the graph, okay? Um, and then, like I said, so I will show you, right? So I'll show you how to do this on the calculator. Um, if you're just given the function and they ask you this, okay? So I'll show you that in, um, in the class, okay? Um, for parabolas, right, if, in other words, if you have, for parabolas, which are shaped like this, okay, okay um, there, I'm gonna, there is a, there is a specific formula, okay, because here you have, right, there's a turning point here and here, so this would be considered as a relative minimum, and relative maximum, so there's a, there's a specific formula that we'll talk about later, okay, um, that, that is in chapter I think chapter three, yep, yeah. chapter three. Okay. All right. The next thing is to uh, talk about the local, the locate, sorry, the, I'm sorry, the, um, the absolute maximum and absolute minimum.
Okay. So uh, I'm going to show you three different situations that could that could happen to illustrate this. And I'm going to go ahead and like, label these points. So A here, and we have C. Okay, so again, that's a turning point. And here we have, I call this B. Over here we have A, and we have C. B. Yep, so this function just stops here. And then let's see, we have A here, C. Okay, so with these three graphs, uh, we're going to look at, uh, we're going, we want to identify the absolute maxima and absolute minima. And then there's, there's an interesting, uh, there's something interesting, uh, there's an interesting, there's a conclusion that we can come out, we can, um, uh, we can derive, or we can, uh, we can uh, illustrate here, okay? All right. So first one, absolute max. Okay, so so generally speaking, when we talk about we talk about the absolute max or min, okay, we're generally it we're generally on a closed interval. Okay, so what I mean is that right for all three of these, we're starting from this point to this point. Here, starting point, end point. Here, in starting point, end point. So, okay. So that's um, that's usually the case, right? When we're talking about when we're referring when we're dealing with absolute max or min, we're lo we're looking right. We're looking at the function on a on a closed interval. Okay, meaning that closed interval. Remember, the boundary points are included. Okay. All right. So let's first look at the, let's look at the first graph. Absolute max. So the absolute max is basically it's very simple. Looking at the graph, you look for the what you look for the highest y value, right? The highest point. The highest point, as you can see in here, right? It's not here, right? Definitely not here. It's here. Okay. So you look at so you look at your endpoints, right? You basically are comparing the endpoints and you're you're looking at the turning point. So those three values. So you see, okay, which one's the largest? Well, it's B. So that is what we so that's what we call the absolute max. Okay. So absolute max, right? Absolute max, right? Is at this point. So let's again, so let's call this f of x. Okay, so the absolute max is going to be B, comma, F of B. Okay. So I wrote it as a coordinate. Okay. So again, when we, if the problem is asking for what is the absolute max, okay, it's technically this value. Okay, f of b. That's your output value. Okay. And remember, this is where it occurs. Okay. Okay. 
So this is your, that's your option max. But sometimes we do, sometimes they may ask for it as in four days, okay? But be sure you understand, be sure you can interpret this, okay? Absolute max, right, is technically, right, it's this value, it's the output, always, okay? Just as with the relative, relative max, relative min. Okay. Okay, so what about the absolute min? Well, absolute min, it's going to be the smallest y value, right? Which one, of, which of these three points is the smallest y value? Well, it has to be this point, C. So say, okay, so it's going to be C, F of C. So absolute min, right, is, is here at this point, at this coordinate, okay? All right, not too bad, right? So you look for, so when you're finding the absolute max and min, you're, for the max, you're looking for the largest y value. For absolute many, you look for the smallest y value. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, absolute max. Again, okay, we have the endpoints and then we have the turning point. Okay, so absolute max is going to be in this case here. That's the largest y value. So that's going to be C F of C. So this, right? So that's where. That's where it happens, or that's where, that's where your, that's where your absolute max is, to, namely f of c. Okay, what about the absolute minimum? Well, again, looking at the smallest y value, that's going to be not here, right? not here, but here at b. This has the smallest y value among these three points, so that's going to be. B comma F of B, okay? All right, so again, maximum, right? Maximum is the biggest, the largest Y value on that interval, okay? Minimum is the smallest, okay? Max is the biggest, min is the smallest, okay? Next one. Hey, what about this one? Okay, absolute max. Okay. Well, again, if we look closely on this point, end point, we have the endpoints, and then we have these two turning, we have these two turning points. So if we look closely, the largest y value right, is going to be this one. So that's going to be B, right? and then F of B. So that's our coordinate, okay? Again, that's the largest y value, right? Largest y value occurs at B. What about the absolute min? Absolute min, that's the smallest y value. So we look closely here, okay? You can see, okay, right? this, this point right here is, right? Slightly, right, slightly smaller, the y value is slightly smaller than this value. So it's going to be a comma f of a. Okay, so again, the minimum is the smallest y value on that, right, for this, for this interval, okay. Right, okay. Okay, so again, absolute max is f of b, it occurs at b. Absolute min is f of c, it occurs at c. Absolute max, f of c, occurs at c. Absolute min, f of b, occurs at b. Absolute max in this case, right? f of b, occurs at b. Absolute min is f of a, it occurs at a, okay? All right, so one thing you note, right? Okay, if you notice, right, in, on, in, every, in each of these situations, okay, the absolute max or min always will either, right, will either occur at the boundary point, like, for example, this one, right? The absolute max is here at the boundary point. And over here, absolute min, right, occurs here at the boundary point. Or it occurs at a turning point, which is what we see here. Absolute max, right? This is the absolute max here in this case. Okay, it's that's at a turning point. The absolute min right here is at this turning point. 
Okay. So whenever, right, whenever you're dealing with absolute max and min, okay, there of a function on a hit on a closed interval, there's a theorem that says that the absolute max or min will always right will, will occur either on the boundary point or at the turning point. Okay. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna write that out. Okay. Very important. So the absolute max, absolute min, always it always occurs at the always occur at the boundary boundary points. or at the turning point. On a closed interval. The only time that, the only time that this may, this may not happen is if you have a special case, and that would be if your if your function is a constant, okay. If there's no change, um, then there is there is no max or min in that case, okay. So this is pertaining to something that's non-constant, okay, or non-constant function. Okay. Very important. Okay. So, yeah. So, again, the absolute max or absolute min will either be on a boundary point, right? It will occur either at a boundary point or at a turning point. Okay. Right. Okay. On a, and this is for on a closed interval. So, closed interval means that your endpoints are included. Like, right? these are included. Okay. All right. Okay, so that brings us to the end of section 1.3. Okay, um, so again, if you have any questions, feel free to come by the Mass Center. Okay, um, I will, um, and oh, and be sure that you, you know, make sure you're keeping up with the homework problems. Okay, and I will see y'all, uh, I will see y'all next time. Okay, next week. Okay, all right, take care.